Russia and having been educated there, uh, having lived there in a way, these are the roots, the cultural roots, the emotional roots, which uh, will always be part of me. come from a, a middle-class family. My father um, was, in those years, a scientist. Uh, a remarkable man in a sense that he had such broad um, intellectual interests. Uh, he was at once working in psychology and electrophysiology of the brain. Later on, he mastered mathematics, bionic cybernetics, uh, and did uh, a lot of research in that field. Uh, he received his education uh, as a, a medical doctor. And so, in a way, I suppose I was influenced by, by this diversity uh, that he had, uh, which he still has to this day, uh, because once he, um, once he retired uh, from the research and from the sciences, he became fascinated by the uh, alternative medicines, acupuncture, acupressure, reflexology, uh, zone therapy. And um, so you can see that even for a person uh, of, of his age, uh, there, is, there is a next life within this one, so to speak. And I think that, that had a tremendous influence uh, on me as well. Uh, my mother was uh, teaching French in a high school and she was the one who, in fact, uh, wanted to see if I had musical gift because she loved music and she studied it in her childhood. And then the, the war started and, of course, all the studies were interrupted and she never came back to it. But I suppose it was a little bit of an uh, unrealized dream in her own life, which perhaps provoked uh, her trying to see if, if I would have a musical gift and become a musician. And whoever it was that tested my musical gifts that you can test when a child is five years old, diagnosed that there were certain, certain talents for music and this is how the whole thing started. It was conceived by Peter the Great as the window to the West because he himself was very interested in Russia coming out of the Middle Ages, so to speak, and acquiring the knowledge uh, uh, that, was, that was by then uh, already significantly uh, more developed in the West than it was in Russia. And Peter the Great wanted to bring the country uh, into, into the same uh, level of knowledge, the same level of, let's say, of prosperity, if you will. And so it's very contradictory. At the same time, the city was built uh, by hundreds of thousands of people in the most miserable conditions. Uh, they came, they worked, they died. And on the blood of those, of those poor people, this magnificent city, in fact, was built.
this square has a tremendous history and uh, a lot of memories to people uh, particularly connected uh, with the Bloody Sunday of 1905, which was on the 9th of January. Uh, it was uh, a Sunday when uh, a group of peaceful poor workers came to demonstrate uh, and to ask the Tsar to present him with a petition, to ask him to improve their living conditions. Uh, they marched through the city and they were led by a priest. They marched from the very poor neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city uh, through, throughout the town and they were told that the Tsar would receive them. And you know, uh, historically, uh, Russian people uh, always believed that the Tsar is a good man and that if only he knew uh, the difficulties that they have in their life and all forms of oppression that were, they were experiencing, that he would intervene and then he would improve their lot. And so, as they were told that, that, that he would receive them, uh, they walked very peacefully on that Sunday, 9th of January, 1905, and finally they arrived through that arch. They arrived on this square and they marched to the gates uh, of, the, of the palace and there they were met by a gunfire from the guards of the palace. In fact the Tsar was not in the palace. He left uh, I think two days earlier for his uh, country retreat and uh, so they were met by the fire and they were all killed. So there were thousands of people lying dead on that Sunday and that uh, precipitated the beginning of the first Russian Revolution in this century, which started in a way spontaneously. It was not organized, it was suppressed very quickly. Uh, some months later, it happened in various cities, the uprisings, but they were all, they were all suppressed. And um, the title of the Shostakovich Symphony No. 11 is 1905. And one of the movements of, of, uh, of the symphony deals with these events that happened on this palace square. In fact, the movement is called Palace Square. And uh, another movement depicts this massacre of these people, uh, which is the second movement. The third movement is a requiem to the victims. And the fourth movement, the finale, is the big, uh, in a way, a big enigma. Because the way the title that Shostakovich gave to it um, it's very difficult to translate it into, into English, but in a way it's something that is anticipation of the events to come. And of course the Soviet musicology uh, and uh, Soviet uh, politicians and authorities, they chose to interpret this last movement as anticipation of the revolution of 1917 that was glorious one for the people uh, when they managed to arrive at, uh, uh, at taking power. Uh, interestingly enough, the symphony was composed after the events of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. And the little key to the understanding of what the finale of the symphony is about lies at the very end in the coda. Uh, one can hear the bells playing two, three notes, alternating between G and B flat and G and B natural. So you have a minor interval and you have a major interval. It ends with the minor interval. So it is not a victorious ending. Therefore it cannot be anticipation of the glorious revolution of 1917. And those two intervals are the same ones that are taken from the um, fugue of the second movement that depicts a massacre of the people that came here on this square to demonstrate. And so there we can find the true answer to the enigma of what the symphony is about and how it ends.
I started with the piano at the age of five, and then when I was seven, I entered the Glinka Choir School in Leningrad, uh, which was uh, a remarkable um, academic institution. Uh, its history went back um, a couple of hundred years. It's a hole that sounds by itself. You never need to, to work hard here to make, to make it sound. And here, right here, in fact, our childhood happened. teacher would quite often say to me uh, don't forget that those who are given a lot will be asked from a lot and that is very much part of the Russian um, tradition of intelligentsia in fact uh, particularly artistic intelligentsia where artists uh, have always been viewed as the moral force of the society а, конечно, в отношении музыки я могу сказать, что его интересная особенность та, что он чрезвычайно обожал музыку, отдавал все силы ей. И вот, скажем так, он у меня был в классе всегда в течение рабочего дня, самый последний, по той причине, что в конце можно заниматься свободно. Столько, сколько, так сказать, он, ну, сколько надо будет. Ну, обычно 45 минут и все. 45. А тут получалось так, что мы с ним занимались гораздо больше, и два, и три часа. Вот как, как сейчас помню, уже училище опустило, уже никого нет, там все разошлись. А мы еще там с ним играем, занимаемся, потом вместе и, играли, кстати, концерт Рахманинова, третий. Ну, такую дивную музыку, конечно, она окрыляла, и хотелось ей заниматься как можно больше. In the evening... Uh, between classes, there were always performances here, so we would come and we would hear uh, concerts of a choir or recitals or symphony concerts. And every year there was a performance, for example, of a Verdi Requiem, conducted by a wonderful man, Yuri Yefimov, and it was, it was one of those occasions that nobody ever forgot because it was uh, such a tremendous intensity of feeling that we all had.
кто должен был чувствовать Чайковский в народе Диверди, прежде всего в Мишне, а в этом великом Капушке. I had the privilege of being a pupil of the legendary teacher Ilya Musin. I was in St. Petersburg to take part in his 95th anniversary birthday concert. Если есть, если этого ощущения динамики нет, дирижер не состоится. Если есть, если. Второе, этого мало. У нас есть такие дирижеры, как Ойстрах, так еще были, были великолепные. Они все это знали, а дирижировать не могли. Что нужно дальше? Дальше нужно развитые мышечные ощущения, настолько развитые, чтобы вот эта мысль дирижерская как-то трансформировалась в ощущение двигательное и чувство, что вот вы что-то хотите передать. Не просто так, а вот, вот так или что-то еще сделать. Это мой любимый ученик, на которого я возлагал очень много и который оправдал все мои надежды. И он является тем, что я могу сказать, что у него нет ничего такого, с чем бы я не был согласен. Особенно мне понравилась вчера на репетиции ваша манера работы. Уважительное к оркестру, точное и без всякого высокомерия. Вот просто вот человек, по-настоящему музыкант, делится своими советами с другими коллегами по музицированию. Это я очень ценю, и в это вы великолепно делаете.
this is the money place. Here they would give you a stipend if you were a good student. And I think I had something like 35 uh, rubles a month, which was quite a bit of money at that time. And also here I would be paid for conducting a performance of Eugene Onegin, for example. And that I think, for that I had 2 rubles 50 kopecks per performance, which is actually a lot less than what you show me now, <laughs> but it probably was worth a lot more in that time. <laughs> in 1971, it was worth a lot more. And so through this little window, the money would come out for all of us who were hungry. Приказ развесить повсеместно. Те, кто не будет исполнять, вернусь и накажу телесно. Узнают про фальсона мать. It so happens in this country that the friendships are formed over a period of time. And as time goes by, the friendship deepens. And it is only after a certain moment where people feel that they can really trust each other that it becomes the kind of friendship that stays for life. always find this in a country as big as that, this kind of paradox, the uh, determination of the establishment to stifle any, uh, any thought that does not correspond to the official dogma, and by doing that provoking the human spirit into something that otherwise perhaps it wouldn't be able to reach. And in many ways that could explain the appearance of artists such as Shostakovich on the scene. Uh, and that is a great mystery to everyone's mind, how it is possible in a society such as that for an artist of this dimension to appear. In 1974, where my debut with the Leningrad Philharmonic Orchestra was cancelled one week before the concert was supposed to take place, uh, the authorities had telephoned the, uh, the Philharmonic people and told them that the concert should not take place, quote unquote. Uh, that was connected to the fact that I did not uh, subscribe to the political dogmas, the way in which I was expected to. Uh, and I was not perhaps wise enough to keep my thoughts to myself. 
So they had become known to the authorities. Uh, and uh, you see, for someone of an age who, of 20, 22 years, in fact, even less than that, uh, the honor of conducting Leningrad Philharmonic Orchestra was unprecedented. Uh, and therefore, it was viewed uh, with great importance by the authorities. And to give this kind of honor to someone who does not fit the bill ideologically, so to speak, was unthinkable for them. So in a way, that triggered my decision to leave as quickly as I could. But I can't say that uh, that was, uh, in a way, the only reason for that. Um, it was during the preceding years where uh, once I became conscious of the life in the society which was built on the idea that was a lie, that from that moment on I became a dissident, not in an active sense, but in a passive sense. And therefore, uh, it was only natural that one day I would have to rebel and uh, say to myself, I don't want to live by a lie. I'm not able to conform. I don't believe in what I'm told I have to believe. And I have to be free. And the only way to do that is to leave. Uh, fortunately for me, it became possible in the 70s when the Soviets were trading people for technology. It was a very simple exchange. I always imagined myself being exchanged for a computer. I came to New York and as I left Leningrad four months before graduating from the conservatory, in a way I have not received any diploma. As a conductor, I can't show anyone whether I am able to conduct without having an orchestra. No one will engage me as a conductor without knowing whether I can do that. So I felt that the best thing would be to try and continue my education. And so I enrolled in the Manus College of Music uh, in New York City. And at that time, it was headed by Risa Stevens. One day, very soon after I had began my studies there, she happened to, uh, to listen to the rehearsal, which I conducted with a student orchestra. So the next day, she called me in and she said, uh, would you like to be a conductor of this orchestra from next year? began to, to know about me and I began to be invited to conduct uh, orchestras, um, a professional orchestras if you will, and that brought me into contact with the Buffalo Philharmonic uh, and with the Grand Rapids Symphony in Michigan and I think those years in fact uh, played a very significant role in my development as a conductor, uh, not only in, in study of the repertoire but also humanly, also in a way of being a leader of, artist, of artistic institution and coming into contact with whatever problems exist in the life of, of an orchestra. Some of them are not necessarily musical, but that will eventually influence the music making. I came to Turkish de Paris in 1989. That sort of was a return to Europe once I went to Paris. I also moved from America where I lived for 14 years. Uh, and so to this day, it has been 
an existence more of a European nature. Being a chief conductor of an orchestra doesn't mean that you conduct every concert that the orchestra will play. And therefore, in preparing a musical season, uh, there are many other artists who will come, guest conductors, guest soloists, and there is an opportunity to create a very eclectic season for an orchestra. The only thing which limits me usually is, is the time, because I don't really want to make music as an instant coffee. I have never been, how shall I say, forced to conduct music which would not be either interesting or important to me, to which I would not feel an affinity. Now, there have been certainly instances where I had to try to conduct a piece uh, without knowing yet whether or not I would want to stay with it later on, particularly with the music of, uh, with the contemporary music, uh, which is something to which I came much later. Uh, and there sometimes it is not possible to know if you will become truly attached to this piece or if it will be simply a, a momentous experience in your life. And fortunately, quite a few works uh, had stayed with me. For example, music of Berio had stayed, music of Henri Dutilleux had stayed, and so on. The music has to communicate and it has to tell you a story. It has to say something that uh, a listener uh, can, can feel being spoken to about something that is important for him, not only for the person who is talking. But of course, before it is going to become important for the listener, it has to be important for the storyteller. It has to do with the cultural identity of music and its roots, where, it, where the music comes from, where it was born, and who are the people that brought it to life, how they lived, how they were brought up, what influenced them, what, they, what kind of air were they breathing when they were composing this music.
Äh, erste Trompete Achtel, bitte ein bisschen weniger dynamisch. Und uh, äh, es ist eine unsichere Stelle, Takt 11, 12, äh, ganzes Orchester. Das hört man nicht genug. Да, эм, и это как бы такой лейтмотив в, в многих местах. Это фигура. Это фигура, особенно в последней части, вот когда такие вещи будут тоже. Поэтому она должна быть презентирована здесь угу. э, уже смелее, можно сказать. Потом... Э, э, I'm sure that everyone has there is no common language. Neither speaks the other's language. Gorky said that eyes are a mirror of human soul. Uh, and therefore, how many times were we confronted with this situation where, without understanding one word, we felt something very deeply and were very touched by it. And we guessed what it was about. And even if we didn't guess it right, it didn't matter. Because it touched us and therefore became important to us. You know, it's very interesting that people say often that, that opera is an art of compromise. I suppose like politics. Uh, there are so many elements which influence the music itself. Uh, for example, what happens on stage at that moment. Uh, the, the singers, how they feel at this moment. What the, the uh, decor on stage is like. All of that influences very much the musical aspect of work. And that's why opera perhaps is the most satisfying art form that I know because it is so highly complex. <laughs> Geht's?
Hat sie eins gehabt? Ich, 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 ich möchte Ihnen jetzt zur Kenntnis geben, dass wir um 18.30 Uhr pünktlich mit dem Stück zum ersten Bild beginnen wollen. 18.30 Uhr, bitte alle bereithalten zum Probenbeginn. Behind every musical sound, particularly written by a great composer, there is always something uh, specific. It may not be the same thing for different people, but there will be something specific with which we can identify, which we can feel. It may have nothing to do with what composer himself felt when he was writing it, but there will be that image. I think uh, every living being, whether it is a human being, has a purpose in life. Whatever the purpose is, but it is there. It has a certain mission in life. And the more significant that living being is, the more complex and the, more, the richer the nature with capital N, in fact, is. This is not about, really about music. Uh, it is not about career. It is, about, uh, it is about a person who exists in this world and, uh, and has to express whatever, uh, whatever interest and gift uh, God bestowed upon, upon the person, so that hopefully it can touch other people in a, in a positive, enriching and often comforting way.
musicians, we always talk about uh, the necessity of going beyond the notes. It's like a horizon that uh, you see a particular horizon from where you stand, but the moment you move one step, the horizon moves with you. It is this endless uh, process in, in the life of a musician. This is why I think we are so fortunate to have this gift given to us.